Hey, hello everybody. Welcome to TL's Roadhouse. Glad to have you in the house with us. Our number one requested guest. We finally got him. Mr. Ryan Upchurch. How's it going, brother? What's up, man? Thank you for having me. It's good to see you. I've good been excited you. about this interview, man. Hey, man, I've been, I think I've been more excited than you, bro. <laughs> it's, so, it's an honor to sit here with you. So, you know, uh, your path has been a lot different than the path that I took. Mm -hmm. But I, I will say this. I have so much respect for people that love the craft and, and, and taking their own journey and kind of finding their way through it all. And I'm just really interested to get to know you and find out what makes you tick and hear about what your thought process was early on, how you got from there to here, building your fan base, how hands-on you are. I want to I hear all those things. Yes, so sir. I want to go back to the beginning. When, when did you decide that you were going to pursue this as a musician? musical career when, how old were you i was about i'd say around like 18 19 years old i was pushed into a corner really and i i seen all these people like you know doing the internet thing making money off of it and stuff uh, my grandfather had just died uh we, he had lost his farm to the bank because you know some other stuff but and I was kind of pushed into a corner, and I, I was already kind of dabbling with music. I liked it. Uh, I, it was it started off with rap music, really. Yeah. And when I seen other people using the internet to do it, I was like, bro, I could do this, you know. And at the time, I was working construction. I was working uh, with Service Master, Instar, people like that, and you know, doing commercial work, uh, residential work, painting stuff like that, prep work. And I was like, if these dudes can do this, I could do this too. And I, I I got a story to tell. Like I ain't, I don't want to lie about nothing. And you know, and I heard I knew country rap was a thing. And where I was living at, and what I was doing, I was like, there's so much more shit that you could say, like that will resonate more with a country person than the stuff that's out now. No offense to the ones that did it, because they're the, they're the ones that paved the way. Like you know, like people like Colt Ford and stuff yeah. like that kind of opened it up. But I was like, there's so much more that could be said right now in a way rowdier way that'll resonate with somebody my age. And there's certain stuff that you know live in this life that when the other person hears it, they're going to be like, all right, this motherfucker knows what he's talking about. Did you start off building loops? Uh, did you get, uh, uh, did you use garage band? What, what did, uh, technically, what did you do early on? Did you find a studio? Did you write a bunch of stuff and go to the studio? Uh, not really. Uh, really, I just kind of thought what it would sound like in my head. And then I would just write the song, looping this thing that is created in my head. Then I started going to people who knew how to make beats and stuff like that. Gotcha. And then I was like, okay, but we got to implement strings and stuff like that into this because you can't have a country rap song with no country in it. You got to have the country in it. You got you got to hear it without the words. So that's where that started. Yeah. As you've kind of gone through the whole process too, man, you know, um, from the outside of looking in, the independent world is extremely different. I kind of came up in the in the major label side of it and, and very passionate about it, but I've been in the independent world since like 2007. And just in the, in like the, in the 20 year span from like 2000 to where we are now, which is 24 years, mm -hmm. the whole landscape has changed. I mean, the, the, the use of social media and the internet, there's so many more tools at our disposal. The labels used to have a stranglehold on all of that. If you didn't have a label and didn't understand the inner workings and promotion and marketing, you were pretty much left out to dry. Yeah. Now the day in that we live in now, we have, have so much access to so many other tools that can help us reach our 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 target audience man it's amazing the things that we have at our disposal mm -hmm. and, and i've seen it change a lot over the last several years man what's uh what's your biggest format is it instagram is it, i mean what um, where do you get the most traction out there i i would say probably youtube and spotify yeah i mean that's where i found all your stuff i mean i discovered you several years ago on youtube i'm really? a youtube junkie i really don't look i don't get on anything else but youtube is youtube is where i go man so I've, Dude, I've, that's cool bro <laughs> <laughs> the legendary country singers be finding out that's cool I, I mean i follow a lot of people i mean uh like uh what's the girl down out the cat the the oh uh, oh god uh i love her Hannah Barron. I mean, I follow all kinds oh, of stuff. Oh, Hannah from Alabama? Yeah, she's Hannah, awesome. man. Yeah, she's want, cool, bro. I go, uh, That's a country girl right there, bro. Catch some catfish. 
Yeah, she is hardcore, man. Oh, yeah. But I, I mean, I, I'm I'm always searching for uh, left of center eclectic things because I kind of consider, consider myself a little left anyway. Mm. Not not politically, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shy, I ain't gonna lie, bro. I know I don't know nothing about politics. That's a good thing. We don't have to talk about none of that. <laughs> oh man, we can. I just I probably won't know nothing. <laughs> Well, it's it's best because our opinion doesn't really matter anyway these days. True. Hey, if it's in the front yard, then I know about it. The British are coming. The British are coming. <laughs> One if by land, two if by sea. <laughs> so I guess you're a big history buff, though. I see you go down a lot of rabbit holes. Here and there, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah tell, me, tell me a good one. Let's find a good one to talk uh, about. I don't think aliens are real, bro. You don't think aliens are real? Mm -mm. You don't think there's a hole in Antarctica where there's a whole other group of mm -mm. people living in the center of the earth? I think we done seen them already, bro. And, and I think a redneck would done got a uh, Bigfoot. What about what about the Anunnaki? You, uh, <laughs> hey, maybe uh, it's just it's so far back. I don't, I don't even know what under what color underwear I got on right now. And that was this morning. So you, you're talking millions of years ago. <laughs> I ain't got a clue. My teachers didn't even teach right. So. I just, man, I, I get bored, man. And I, I mean, I can spend hours going down some of the strangest rabbit holes and finding all kinds of weird stuff out there. And and before they started clamping down all all, all that, after, after 2020, uh, everything changed. Like, everybody that I followed on YouTube mm -hmm. got shut down. <laughs> oh, bro. Everything. I, I, I mean, everybody I followed got shut down. Yeah. I mean, it, it all went away. And none of the, I mean, I have a hard time finding things that really interest me. Yeah. yeah. Same. I, I've been I've been doing a lot of history, watching a lot of history, but not on, uh, not on your normal history platforms like History Channel or nothing like that. I've been finding like documentaries and stuff from the forties, yeah, and stuff like that that are on like actual, like a real camera. So, so um, just stuff on YouTube and stuff that you find. Uh, yeah, just kind of like uh, old C-SPAN stuff and you know shit they don't want you to see. Then you see it and you're like, wait a minute, this doesn't, this don't match up with what we know now. What's up with that? Yeah, yeah but there's a whole lot of that stuff going on. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of things that don't match up with what's going on now. Why? Why is that? Ah, uh, man, I don't know. I, I, I think. Uh, what do you think about MK Ultra? Oh, I think it's very real. Oh yeah, absolutely. I believe MK Ultra is real, and I think it started a long time ago. The CIA was doing all that stuff, and I believe it's very prevalent out in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at Britney Spears, man. I, I think it's like a, it's like one of those tools that nobody used to have, and now everyone has access to it, so people can kind of use it however they want. Well, they just understand there's so much that's understood in the world that we live in now. Uh, there's terms for it, like uh, bipolar and schizophrenia. There's right. all that stuff right now, and, and a lot of it is about inter introducing trauma at an early age mm -hmm. and being able to split those personalities. You ever watch that movie, Freaking Split? Was it not Tom Hardy? What was in it where he had like like 20 something personalities? Mm. That's some craziest crap I ever saw. But but there's some, I mean, I, I really believe that it's real that if you, if you introduce trauma to people at certain stages of their life, you can. And actually block certain parts of their personality out. I, oh, I yeah. believe they've done intense studies, Colors, meditation, all that stuff. Color spectrum, yeah. Uh, flashes, light. Well, yeah, there's yeah, all kinds of stuff. Strobes. I mean, that stuff can put you into a, a, a seizure. Or, oh yeah. Or, or induce trauma. I mean, it can. That's do why I don't use UV. Uh, the color UV of UV at my shows, or infrared. Huh. Never it gives you headaches. Really. Yeah. And if you look on the color spectrum, red is all the way to the left. Uh, UVs all the way to the right. That's why your screen uh, on your phone actually keeps you awake because it re the color of the LED releases a chemical in your brain that will keep you awake. Really? Mm-hmm. Yep. Wow. That's interesting. That's mm -hmm. why there's that, that night mode thing on there where you can turn it a little mm -hmm. more red or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm blind. I got to have everything bright as hell when I turn my stuff on. Because I'm bad about, I, I got my earbuds, mm -hmm. things, man, and I, I, I will put one in my ear when I go to bed. And mm -hmm. I, I try to find something that's about an hour long because as soon as I put those things in my head, it's like I just freaking go to sleep. So I'm finding stuff, I'm old history stuff, but I like longer clips that I can mm -hmm. kind of go to sleep to. And then Can I suggest you something? Yeah. When you go to sleep, next time if you want to go to sleep real fast, type in MHZ on YouTube and find 423 or 426 megahertz. That's right. I'll be asleep in 10 minutes. 
they say that those frequencies have a lot to do with stuff too, man. Oh yeah. But you can go up now because 420 is what everything is tuned to music wise in the studio. Everything we do is 420, and I think 440. 440. I'm, four, I'm sorry, 440. But I 420 is fine. I think they were talking <laughs> yeah, yeah, about four. You good. could drop down to 420 or 430, and it's a much more soothing thing that's supposed to be conducive of creativity and less. Uh, all oh yeah, stuff. you are uh, out at four forty. The, the binaural beats as well, so you have a different frequency mm -hmm. each, in each ear. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's literally like a brain massage, and, and then your brain awesome. supplies a third tone. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the? Well, is, how is do you know, you Scott? Your video. <laughs> I know, and I'm also colorblind. Yeah. I, I actually, uh, before my music gets mastered and put out to everybody, I make sure that it's not on a megahertz that is like harmful in any type of way and stuff like that. Like that's how far we'd be diving into this shit now. I'll be dying. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, cool. Look at that. That's pretty interesting, bro. Oh yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff with sound, man. Like, uh, they have there's a certain frequency that you can put in a song that's that is not harmful, really, if you just use it for a second. Who and, was the one that actually came up with 440 being standard tuning for everything? I think that wasn't that the Germans. I think it might have been. Yeah. Well, there's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> with a lot of great shit. There. <laughs> yeah. But I but I ask that because I mean I, I've seen a lot of stuff that talks about how those different frequencies have different effects on your mood and see things like that I think are having an effect on things. It's just like the way the music industry now everything is so hard tuned that the vocals all sound the same. Oh, and if you can play, you can pick out the top ten songs last year, and most of them are exactly the same freaking tempo. A lot of them are in the same key. You yes. go from the one to the next one, and it's just all this place. It's all right there. Where did all the personality and 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 the 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 dynamics of of the oh. format go? Yes, bro. Yes, like, dude, you can listen to a song now, and like on the radio to to, to a standard radio in somebody's car. I can't really make the lyrics out in a country song right now. Not one that's on the radio. Alan Jackson, Clay Walker, uh, Jimmy Martin, you like. That's the dynamic. That was the dynamic era. That's when you had to have a special voice. Well, if you look when we when we finish a record now, since we went from uh, from tape machines to Pro Tools, when by the time okay, when I do a demo, you will be able to see the dynamic in the graph at the bottom when yes. you when you get that in the graph. And then by the time you get through that, when you cut a master on it, you're going through rough mixes. There's still a bit of movement. When you get the master mix finished, then it's going to be almost peaking out. By the time you get to mastering, there's nothing in there, but it's all the way. There's nothing there. There's no dynamic. Yeah. It, everything is slammed all the way to the top of the threshold, and it's just it's sucked all the life out of it to me anyway. No, yeah. There's no vocal personality. It's so tuned that any of those little nuances and things that George mm -hmm. Jones used to do, all that would be gone. If you went back in and, and tuned George Jones to what the graph showed you, somebody that didn't tune by ear, that really felt pitch and felt what emotion was in a song, yes. it would sound like crap. Bro, amen. Absolutely. Amen, it, it really like would. And you know, recently, that's funny you say that, because uh, B, what was it, uh, two years ago, Heavier Rain? I seen another country singer and they were like, you know, you know the saying, three chords and the truth. I said, no, you could do it with two chords and a true story. And we did. Hey. And it trended for a week. And it was, it's one of my biggest uh, country songs in the past two years. And it's, it's, it's a rough draft. Guitars and Cadillacs is two chords. Whew. Amen, bro. I'm telling you, man. Uh, so this, the simpler, the better. They've overcomplicated everything. And the, what irritates me the most is that when you hard tune and you slam up everything like that, all those little things where you flow through. And and here's another thing, and I've, I've had to adapt to this when producing records. When we go in and we talk about all this stuff. You used to, you want the dynamic in the band. Mm -hmm. And you wanted the band to play through those things. Nowadays, everybody's programmed to where dynamics are created by adding and taken away in the mix. Yes. They're not done by letting the band build and crescendo and suck back. It's just, it, it, and it bothers me. It, it should bother you. And that's good that it does. And knowing that it does bother you honestly makes me happy because it's like, okay, <laughs> they, they really do care about the sound. You know? The, Absolutely. The ones that paved the way in my lifetime, they, do, they did care about the sound because now they don't, bro. Like, 
It's, well, but how much of it? Here's here's the problem, and and we can all blame artists. We can go down that road that all these new artists don't understand. The problem is the labels are dictating that everything has to be turned into a record label. When you're on a major, oh, yeah. all of it's turned in, and they will send it back and say, "Turn that vocal up, compress this harder." And then by the time you go through mix compression, master compression, then you send it out to radio, they're gonna compress the crap out of it one more time. By the time it gets to radio, everybody sounds the same. They do, they do. And I, I remember waking up for school, two thousand eight, two thousand seven. And every morning I would turn on CMT uh, Top 20 and listen to it while I was getting ready for school. You know what I mean? And I, you enjoy, you wanted to wake up and turn on CMT. Oh, yeah. To hear, because you got to see the new video. You got to see the new song or whatever. And even, even, it, it wasn't that long ago that a, that a song meant more than it does now. Yeah, it did. But but nowadays, and I, I use my children as, as my barometer on that. I got a 20 and a 22 year old. I remember being excited and waiting for the next album release from my favorite artist. Mm. I mean, the next Merle Haggard record that was coming out, the next Ronnie Millsap record that was mm. coming out, and having to go to the store and and uh, we're sold out. You got to come back in two weeks, man. Mm. You had to wait for the for the 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 record uh, company to come in and see which ones had sold. Then they turned the order in, so it was two weeks before you get restocked. Yeah. Now things everything goes through a register and comes back. But my point being, kids have access to everything in their phones, so they. They don't anticipate anything yep. like we used to. Yep. And I think it's taken the specialness of music away from what we do. Now, there are a lot of purists and people that are trying to really bring that back. And I think uh, there are some people that understand that, that, mm -hmm. that really are passionate about it. But, but I'll go back to what I said before. You know, a lot of the record labels have complete control over all that stuff. And that's why I've enjoyed being on the other side of my label and my, my commercial career so much more. I'm glad that I had the body of work, and I'm glad that I got to have it in a time where I still had creative control and I right. was able to make the music that I wanted to make because I have to sing it the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. But I also enjoy this place that I'm at now where I don't have to answer or behold anything. Right. And, man, dude, the, the, the time span, too, you got, if you ask me, it's like you got the, the best of both of those worlds. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know that was the, that that was. If you ask me, I think the two thousands was the last of the good country music. So think about this. Go back to nineteen eighty nine. Uh, I was living in Louisiana, playing in a circuit band, and that was the year that changed my life. I was mm. a Merle Haggard fan, Waylon Jennings fan, Willie Nelson. You know all that stuff. I mean Dwight Yoakam. You know uh, Randy Travis. All that stuff from the eighties. George Strait, huge George Strait fan. Mm -hmm. But in eighty nine. Mark Chestnut came out, Alan Jackson came out, Travis Tritt came out, Vince Gill came out. You had Clint Black. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you, you got all these guys, and music changed for me right mm. then because everything went to a different place, and that was when I decided right then I moved to Nashville the next year because everything was getting younger, and it was picking up speed, and there was so much energy in the town, and, yes. and everybody had their own place. You know, we were all proud. I was proud that Chestnut was having hits, and I was proud that Joe Diffie was having hits, and they were proud for me, and me and Bird were tight, and all these guys, there was so much camaraderie, and it's got so corporate now. Man. I was going fishing, though. Absolutely. You know what I mean? But we were sharing things, and everybody had their own place. Yes. Uh, and there wasn't the animosity like there seems to be. We, we didn't feel that way. We we loved to see each other when we had shows together. We'd hang out on each other's bus and go party together. Yes. And, and you know why I think that is, personally? I mean, I, I wasn't there, but I think it's because y'all all knew for a fact y'all were chosen because y'all had a special talent and a special sound, bro. Like, like, you, you could take somebody that ain't worth a shit now and make them a star with all the stuff we talked about with the sound stuff. That's why when you hear somebody sing live, it's like, ah, oh, yeah. it's like, it's like, are they doing vocal warm-ups? No. But there's, there's such a problem when you hard tune everything like that. Uh, I'm not capable of reproducing that live because that's not the way I sing. Right. And when you go out and hear somebody that's been over-processed like that, it's really hard to reproduce because there's certain things that not, that each of our voices don't do. I mean, right. we have a natural thing and a flow and a way. I sl I'm bad about sliding up on notes. If you hard-tune me up to where it's just hitting that note hard, and that's not the way I sing, you yeah. know? It's hard to get that, and, and it tricks you. It tricks your brain. Like, when you're sitting there trying to sing with that hard tune, you are overshooting or undershooting, and it's still not hitting where you want to. And then you're like, dude, turn that shit off. Please. There's this phenomenon going on now where these kids are hearing all these hard-tuned vocals on the radio or they're 
Snapchat. And they're or, learning or, to or, sing like that. They're learning to sing like that. That weirds it's me crazy, out. Crazy man. It sounds, they already sound like robots. So yeah, do you on. feel like there's a fine balance? You know, guys like Jack White. That that is so old school that won't use any digital stuff. Still tapes on tape machine. Uses all tube amps and all the tube processors and things. There's guys like that, but there's there's a balance in there somewhere. Oh, bro, you, you, vocal wise, dude, go back to the '90s grunge rock era with like Lane Staley from Allison Chains. Like, bro, you you got to think like those guys. First off, they were openly like, "I do all this shit and I don't care." One, right, regardless of whatever they're doing, it ain't my fucking business. They're being truthful about it. Fuck hiding everything. Yeah. Like, if you do something, okay, you do it. And well, you, then you never got to lie about it. Just like with the, the singing stuff you're talking about. A microphone comes out or it gets unplugged on us, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but uh, I've been to some shows where if, if something went wrong with the computer uh, and the band shut down and that vocal's still playing and nobody else is there. <laughs> uh, oh, <laughs> three nights in, yeah, I feel uh, you, bro. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I'm not that guy. <laughs> I'm not but that man. guy. We're we're still the band that goes out with everybody that's running twenty tracks, and we don't use mm. one. Oh wow! <laughs> we nice. don't even we don't use none of that shit. That's cool, bro. I'm, we don't. I'm glad to hear that. I have, I have tried. Had not tried. Yeah, you tried. And it, yeah. I'm and glad it's, it didn't work. I hate it. <laughs> hey, bro, y'all hear Uncle Tracy, bro? Y'all better step y'all's game up. It just doesn't. But I I mean we've gone out and and gone out and 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 opened for or, or went behind a really hot four piece band that's got hits on the radio. I'm not gonna say names. And it sounds like there's a freaking orchestra on the stage, and then us six assholes walk out there and do what we do. But what's cool <laughs> is, is those people, they'll come up to us and be like, man, you guys, there's so much sound coming off that stage, and just to know that it's coming from your hands and your feet and you know your your vocals, away, yeah. and know that it's not coming from a computer, it, they, it's just so refreshing and a breath of, of fresh air to them. To, to and the fans know. Yeah. Oh, they know. They know. They know, they know. But I, I like to not be hand-tied. Uh, if I want to make a set change yes. and my light guy has to adjust to it, yeah. if you're running a whole bunch of tracks, mm -hmm. you can't do that. Bro, yes, we, we <laughs> yeah. can't do that, yeah. man. I remember when I was starting out, this is probably one of the craziest things, and I, I've told this story a few times, but when I was a teenager and even in, before I came to Nashville and I was playing in a little circuit band, I had uh, I'd taken poster board and color coded things like I had a pink one, a green one, a yellow one, and and so I would laminate them. I had I had all my two step stuff on one. I had all my ballots and waltzes on one. I had my mid tempos on one. I had all my rocking stuff on on one. I would go on stage at the first set. We'd usually do four or five sets a night. I would tell you what the first two songs were. I'd throw them on the stage and I'd call them out as I went. Yep. that was the way I played my show. Hey man, dude, I still I take mine to the floor too, like that. Well, I laminated them because I usually would spill beer on them, yep, yep. <laughs> or tear them up with your boots. Absolutely. So I just got them where I just throw them down. I could reuse them. Man, that's cool. <laughs> man, it, I I just want to say, you know, I, I know this is kind of like off subject, but I just want to say, like, it's it it really is cool to me to sit here with somebody like you. And talk about music in general. I just want to say that. I appreciate it, bro. Yes, sir. I mean, I still love it. We all do. I'm oh, still yeah. passionate about it, man. This has been my life's journey. 100%. I mean, I've dreamed about it since I was freaking this big. I remember singing Glenn Campbell and Charlie Pride songs when I was four years old, man. I mean, it goes that deep. Uh, wait, uh, who's your favorite? Who is your favorite country singer? Man, it's two of them. And it's, well, let me show you. This is my country music. You got my glasses? This is my country music, Mount Rushmore. This is George Strait and George Jones and Keith Whitley and Merle Haggard. Keith Whitley, heck yeah, bro. These are my guys. That's cool. And there's a, I, I could put a lot more on there. I could do Charlie Daniels, mm -hmm. Waylon Jennings and Willie. There's a whole nother list. But these were the guys that I really emulated. Mm. George was huge to me. Haggard was huge to me. I got to spend a lot of time with George Jones early really? on. I mean, I, he was the first big tour that I was on, so I spent the first couple of years out on the road, and I learned so much from Man, him. He, he was so cool to me. I spent more time with George than anybody. I was a huge Whitley fan, but Whitley died like right before I came to Nashville. Mm. So, I, you know, I've got to be friends with Lori and Jess Keith and the family and been tight with them for years. But, I mean, so he was he was kind of the one that I never got to meet, man. Mm. I, I, I met all the rest of them, man. you know, worked with all the rest of them. Who's the craziest? I'm sorry. Hang on. I got some, oh, I got on, some asking questions, bro, but I'm That's sitting here with good. Tracy Lawrence. You feel me? Let's talk. Dude, who's your, uh, who is, uh, what's the craziest um, like what's the craziest thing you've ever seen like at a show you're like what the hell what what the hell just happened oh, wow <laughs> that I did for somebody else I ain't sure yeah what well, you did <laughs> I gotta wait for a few more people to die before I tell all my stories <laughs> <laughs> I 
I don't know, there. man. I've seen a lot of crazy stuff. I mean, I as I've gotten older, I don't like all the rowdiness. There's a couple of clubs that I used to play all the time that I've mm -hmm. kind of knocked off the list. The last one that I went to, I saw a girl get hit right between the eyes right in front of the stage by a beer bottle. And there was like Ooh. three or four like major brawls going on all the place. Like, I'm not coming back here if you're not going to take care. If you don't have security, take care of your people. I'm not. Doing oh, amen. This. Amen. I don't, I don't want to deal with that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to play up there and, and uh, play music to bar fights. I, I just hate that stuff. Yeah. But I, I've seen some strange things out there. But, you know, man, I just, I, I don't know. What's mm. your craziest? Oh, God. I, I've, I've seen them drag some people out of your shows. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, craziest? Um, the riot. The first riot, not the second one. The first one. Oh, there's more than one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Tell me about it. Colt For so we got to this place, and Colt Ford, we get there, and uh, Colt Ford's walking between the buses, and he was like, hey, he's like, Watch out. He's like, there's people climbing up on the stage around me and stuff when I was on stage. And I was like, what? I was like, what do you mean? He's like, there's not, like, real security here. It's just, like, some bubbas and they all getting drunk, which is cool. But the bubbas can't be having a security shirt on taking their security while they're drunk, you know? And long story short, uh, these two girls got into a head-on collision on four-wheelers. And one of them broke their neck. Oh. And, yeah, it was. <laughs> this was a long time ago in my career. It was, like, in the beginning. And... Long story short, they tr they called a helicopter life light. When I, the life light got there, well, first off, the Bubba's tried to pick up the girl with the broke neck out the ditch and throw her in a, like a can am or whatever. To, and I was and my people was like, no, don't do that, because one was a military uh, paramedic. And then the life light came, and then for some reason, somebody who was hosting the event started shooting fireworks, so the helicopter couldn't land. So I got on stage and I was like, ah, you know, said some crazy ass shit, <laughs> threw the mic down. I was like, I'm fucking leaving. And it started a, a, a riot, and then they pro people were trying to run uh, run them over with trucks and four wheelers. And I was unscrewing the mic stand because this really big dude was talking shit, and I was like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> and all kind of stuff. But yeah, I do remember one. I don't. I, uh, Scott might have been about. I don't think you were junior. It's been several years ago. We played some festival. It's like up in Tracy City, uh, just outside first? of Chattanooga. Oh, Tracy City. Uh, yeah. And I remember they had they had these big high chain link fences on the sides of the stage coming to the backstage. And this old woman, I, she had to be 75, 80 years old. Wow. She stripped down butt naked. She had the two, you know. She, I got wild. Climbed the fence, started coming backstage trying to get to me. Oh, yeah. That's oh, good. She, said, oh, she said, give boy. me some sugar, baby. <laughs> Let me pull my teeth out and give you one. Oh, shit. <laughs> Oh hell yeah! <laughs> oh, you see it all from up there, man. Oh, man. I'm telling you, man. It's... What you think about? Oh, never mind. Sorry. No, come on. Let's what go. You, what you think about Jimmy Martin? Tell me, I don't really know Jimmy. Martin. Jimmy Martin. Uh, he's kind of like the first. If you ask me, he's kind of like the first like major country singer that kind of got like shunned from uh, the mainstream in a sense. But like a long time ago, uh, like back Roy Acuff days and stuff like that. He was just this really talented motherfucker from Tennessee, and he. I'll have to do he some was research. So talented, on him. they they were like, "No, we can't. You're you you like this shit way too much. Like, you know, this dude's like snorting coke and staying up. Or no, I don't know if he's snorting coke or not, but he was he, probably he, drinking a lot. He makes a joke. They make a joke. I don't know what it means. I don't know the terminology. He, they called it a uh, red seven up, uh, whatever that is. It was a long time ago, so I don't know the terminology. But they said that this motherfucker would be up all night, like walking around, doing music, being outside with his friends, or hell, even by his damn self, to the point where his whole entire house turned into pretty much like a studio of like memorabilia and stuff. And he was a he was just a, he was a really great artist, bro. And I don't think he ever got the recognition he deserved. Most of the stories that I've heard about guys like that wound up just writing songs for a living because <laughs> mm. they just couldn't go out in public very much. I mean, I've heard some. Oh no, this guy he 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 was he was fine out in public. He was a people person and everything. He just liked to throw down. Well, well no, I was just, he was just too good at music, really? like for his time. Really, mm. yeah. There's a lot of interesting characters through the years, man. Mm -hmm. You hear lots of stories, man. There was a lot of old, old Waylon Jennings stories, man. I've heard some crazy stuff about Waylon and Cash over the years. Oh, damn. I'm telling you. I, I mean, I'm sure you've heard the one uh, where I cut my first album was a studio right there on the 17th Avenue called 1111, right there on the corner of, of 17th and Grand. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's second building back from the corner of, the, of 17th and Grand. And uh, that's where I cut Sticks and Stones. And when we got in there, everybody started telling the stories of when Waylon was there. They were cutting mm -hmm. a record. There was a song that Waylon had called 
Don't y'all think this outlaw bit's done got out of hand? Mm -hmm. It started out to be a joke the law don't understand. There was a a mail package that was delivered to the front door, Mm -hmm. a block of cocaine. Oh, shit. And the feds were outside watching. And Waylon went to the door and got it. They were sitting up in the front lounge, and he saw the feds out there and went and flushed it down the toilet. And they came storming in. They came pounding through the back door in the middle of a song. Go back and listen to that lyric. That's all a true story. The feds were in the control room, and and Waylon was out there in the vocal booth. So the engineer was like, Waylon needs to hear this shit. So engineer leans against the console and hits the talkback mic. Mm -hmm. So Waylon can hear everything that's going on in the control room, but the dudes in the control room, you know, the feds, they didn't know that Waylon could hear them. Uh. So Waylon took that and he ran. He took that opportunity to run to the bathroom real quick and, and flush all the stuff. So bust Damn. me for possession of something that was gone, long gone. That's, that's oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> great stories, that's man. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> he's po- he's processing right now. <laughs> shit, I read his autobiography and I th- I'm just thinking, I'd have walked outside and be like, "Yo, feds, who the fuck was this here?" <laughs> but I think he said uh, at the time that he quit doing blow. Uh, that last week, his last purchase was like twenty thousand dollars worth. Holy crap! He's, he's like, all right, dude, this this, this guy is that a bunch of? Is that like a bunch of coke? Oh, <laughs> I would assume so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I've never I've seen never that, seen so. coke in real life. <laughs> I haven't either. Me neither. <laughs> but, uh, I would I would assume it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> seen a shit ton of weed though. <laughs> I've seen a shit ton of all of it. It's rooms. Uh, I ain't done nothing. Yeah, I ain't done nothing. I ain't done nothing. I ain't gonna do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come here and I ain't leaving. <laughs> You yeah. never do leave. Uh, you know what? And even if somebody does, though, it's like, fuck it, who cares? We're all adults, you know? Like, I, that's the one thing I can't stand with. A motherfucker sitting there like, how? why are you doing this? Because I want to. Because I'm an adult. Because I'm over 18, motherfucker. <laughs> so let's go back to music, man. All right. Let's talk about what you've learned along the way from the very first project that you cut to what, the new stuff that you've done now. What, what's, what's your growth? What do you see? What's different now? With how you, with your process and, and how you start and how you finish. Well, the main thing that I've realized is don't trust anybody. You trust your gut. And to trust your gut, you got to keep your gut instinct as natural as possible and not influence your brain with a bunch of uh, everyone else's input. You have to get to seclude yourself and go towards what you like. And you got to make your own decisions. Uh, second thing, what has changed? I've become more of a composer than anything like i'm very weird and specific about my music i don't i just don't put out anything uh i know exactly what i want to do uh, i get in there and i do it if i say hey this needs violin this needs uh banjo this needs uh lap steel this needs i'm getting it i'm finding it somehow some way or i'm learning how to play it and that's mainly on this uh last album i did we uh it was seven days because I wanted to test myself, because I was like, okay, I've got 20 albums out. Most of them are either gold or platinum, and I am where I'm at. i got to start testing myself. So that's what I started doing. And this last uh, few weeks ago, we said seven days, or no, no, this is the second time we've done this. So the first album is called Blue Jeans 1. We did it in seven days, and we were like, bro, that was really cool, testing yourself like that, trying to crunch everything in and play the instruments and, you know, co-produce and all this stuff, two people in a room. So then, the second time we did it, uh, which was last week, we made another one. And this time, I got, it was me, Broadnax, uh, JJ Lawhorn, uh, T2, and Boosie Badass is on it too. And am I I forgetting anybody, B? And we did it in seven days, and bro, it was madness. But it was the most beautiful madness ever, bro. We had banjos and lap steels and shit going all back and forth. And when you're creating like that with other people who love music is just as much as you do, bro, there ain't nothing nobody can do to stop you. And it's just, and I've also learned that the thought process is being crunched down, like you said, into this weird format. And I think the people who get to say what goes out and what don't, don't listen to music like we do. They don't no. know it. If so, tell them pick up an instrument and do something on the song. They can't. They're too busy driving a Ferrari. <laughs> so how, how, uh, how big of a crew do you have with you for all your social media stuff? Because you've got a huge social media. That's, that's pretty much your, your format. Oh, uh, me and him. Yeah. Y'all, the creative, you do all the camera work. b Lo. b he's, uh, b um, we met, shit, bro. It's been, so, it's been like, what, six, seven years ago? Uh, yeah, going Yeah, man, I was living in this that's little cool. bitty-ass trailer, bro. I, by the way, give me some skin, bro. <laughs> I was living in this junky-ass trailer in the trailer hood, bro. 
people pulling up. You know, I started getting a little bitty buzz or whatever back in the day. Started having some people pull up, be like, "Hey man, you want these rocks?" I'm you know, get out, get out of my fucking yard, motherfucker. Well, fast forward to now, he's been with me ever since the day we met. We've never split up ever. He's from Texas. I'm from Nashville. Born and raised. He's Texas. Born and raised. And we've been together ever since, bro. And the first night we stayed together, I think we shot two or three music videos and edited them, and all the, like the same night. We've been together ever since, bro. Been best friends ever since. When you start doing your little shorts and stuff, do you just kind of have a concept and you just go out and roll with it? What? How? How, how in depth do you prepare before you go out and do stuff? Zero seconds before. Just, just go with it. Yep. Yeah. If I'm feeling some type of way, everybody's feeling nobody, and that's that's something that I think is missing from music nowadays. Because you got to think, like we're talking earlier, back in the day, which wasn't that long ago. It sounds like a long ago when you say back in the day, but back in the day, like yesterday. A country singer will a country singer will tell you how the fuck they feel about something, and if you didn't like it, you'd have to say something back to them, and y'all either fought or figured it out. You know what I mean? Nowadays, it's too it's too business. It's like everybody's the fucking FBI. Everybody's like, uh, bro, what, are you putting this out? What are you doing? Who are you talking about? Motherfucker, listen and find out. Like, you, like why is everybody so like suspect and like be like, oh, is it about me? It's all a business. It's like it's like war games. It's like, dude, pick up the guitar. Or get on the mic and just leave it at that. Like, it's not my fault that I get to say whatever I want at all times, and you can't. And that's the thing. And I think in my career so far, I personally feel like, which I'm going to be biased because it's me, but I feel like, I feel like I'm proof, I'm proof that the canceling shit's bullshit. I feel like I'm proof that you, you don't need this big, humongous, fucking huge machine behind you. And it's also proof in a timeline with other artists. And I'm not going to say who, but I've been texting artists before. We're in the same building. And they're like, yo, bro, what, what, you want to hang out? And Where you at? I'm like, I'm at Aldean's. And they're like, me too. And then, boom. And then nothing. I'm like, what the fuck? Are they okay? I hope they're all right, you know? And then some lady will come to me and be like, no, you, you need to stay away. Don't y'all can't be seen beside each other. I'm like, who the fuck are you? Who are you? Like, who's fucking who are you? And why are you telling me this? I don't fucking give a fuck. Like, I'm just trying to chill, bro. I'm a normal person just like everybody else. Like, I don't know why you trying to put a cage around me on top of Al Dean's, but this is kind of weird. <laughs> and people are gonna get to see that in the future, bro. And there's a huge gap in music history that is the past 10 years and kind of still going on. And that's why I'm like, bro, they need to catch on to this and figure something out to where uh, they're not looked at as this kind of person in the future, somebody who was controlled by everybody, because that's not going to be good in the future. Because well, I'll tell you what happens if you're controlled that much and they dictate the music that you cut and you're going to look back in, the, in about 10 or 20 years and you're going to hate everything you do and you're going to be miserable doing what you spent your life doing. You're not going to want to do it anymore. Right. Because they're going to feel some kind of uh, form of resentment against their self for for certain decisions they made when really or certain decisions they let other people make for them I, exactly that, that's what i mean like and what they don't know is they got the power <laughs> i know you're seeing this right now you got the power bro <laughs> you're the money maker bro tell them what you want don't, don't listen to what they want all the time be like put your foot down and be like hey bro now this is what we're gonna do and hey the last person i know of that done that and i'll i'll, I'll say his name because he's my homeboy it took a lot to be his friend, but it was worth it. He he made sure JJ Lawhorn, bro. JJ Lawhorn was with uh this these people. You can believe this out if you want to. He was with this uh, people called Average Joe's, mm -hmm. and he had this song called Stomping Grounds. So this is a this is a good uh, example. And JJ is the kind of person you can't tell him jack shit, but he's also <laughs> he's also the one getting turkeys. He's also the one who is the actual farmer in real life. He's he's got the cows. He he does the thing with the horses where you sc have to scrub their ding a ling and get the shit off of them. He do, you know you know what I'm talking about. What kind of farm is this? Oh, bro, no. <laughs> bacteria will grow. I, I grew a, up on a farm. I never had to do that. Bacteria will grow around a, a, a horse's dick, and you got to get it off, or their bladder will like get infected and stuff sometimes. But anyway, um, they told him they said you're gonna film stomping grounds. In, on the strip of, of Nashville And he's like no It's not my stomping grounds we're gonna go to the country And they're like no we're not And he's like well fuck it I ain't doing it then And he didn't 
And he's left ever since. And it took a long time for me to gain his respect, but I, I gained it because I wanted it. Because he was another real motherfucker in this day and age that I could get along with that has been done the same way. And it, it ain't far along from these uh, us kind of artists kind of taking over, bro, because people are starting to see, they're like, okay, why are they making five albums a year and they're all good? And why am I having to wait fucking 10 years for this guy to put something out? I don't know why you're doing that. That's, they need to change the way they do shit. Otherwise, they're going to get left in the dust in the future. For so, real. So a couple other questions. Hmm? How often do you post? Because that's that's a separation where you and I are moving in different places. I, I can't do the posting all the time. There's so many people that are logging into TikTok five, six, seven, nine times a day. Mm -hmm. People that are doing all that. That's why I do the podcast. Right. Because it's a comfortable format for me. I love talking with people. I get to meet some new and interesting people and make new friends. And then we just chop it up and use it in all these other places. Mm -hmm. I'm not a guy that's going to get up and freaking post every day. I'm not. Right. That's not the world I grew up in. I'm not comfortable with yeah. it. I can't do it. I mean, how much are you posting? Are you doing it multiple times a week? What, what's, your, what's your thought process? Uh, when I, you feel it? I, yeah. I don't, I don't really have a, a process on it. Just kind of in the midst, if I'm fishing, if I'm building something, if I'm cleaning my yard, if I'm playing with my dogs or whatever I'm doing, I'll just pick it up and be like, hey, this is what I'm feeling right now, and put it back down. Yeah. Because I just want the people who follow me to listen to my shit to know where I'm standing at on everything at like all times. Like if there's something that pops up on the news, a cultural thing or anything that you hear going on that, that just kind of runs in your brain. Yeah, it's just something that you go with. Yeah, it's mostly, it's mostly music stuff. Um, music stuff or if somebody's like, kind of trying to stab at me or something, I'll be like, hey, guys, look what they're doing. So they can see the whole process with me. So they can see not only me for who I am, but other people for who they are. Because I feel, I feel like they deserve that. You know, they're, they're the ones paying for the tickets. They're the ones buying the merch. They're the ones listening to the music. They're the ones getting us to where we're at. So it's only right to, to be real and do them right. How long has it been since you've been on tour? Uh, I have no idea. How long, B? Been off for and a you're year getting and ready to go back on tour. You got a new album done? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. What's the name of it? Uh, what are the names of them? Blue Jeans 2, Blue Jeans 1, Pioneer, uh, People's Champ. What's the country one? Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Concert for the Crickets. And so y'all are getting geared up. Do you know when y'all go out? March 9th. Oh, so y'all getting ready. We're That's starting good. in the, starting at the Muni. Thing. Cool. Yep. I love that place. Yeah, I played some good events there, man. That's that's a pretty cool. That's one of the older venues in town. Historical, it's, absolutely. Love that place. So tell me about the Holla Boys, man. She. I know you want to give a shout out to all that, man. Shout out. There goes my question. What's the difference between a Holla Boy and Creek Squad? Uh, Creek Squad is kind of like uh the, the internet base, I guess, in a way. Are they kind of like Swifties? Uh, what's a Swifty? <laughs> I think Molly knows what a Swifty is, bro. <laughs> no, no, not you. Uh, uh, my drummer Molly. She said that the other day. That's what Taylor Swift calls her fans, Swifties. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I think I think Creek Squad probably a little bit cooler than Swifties, but I'm just kidding, Taylor. But um, uh, I I I I, I kind of. I don't know a lot about Taylor Swift, but I do respect her business moves. Oh, she's... I see what you did there, girl. Oh, yeah. Hey. She, uh... Alien she brought, brain. She knows. Yeah, she, uh, she broke it off in a couple of big players that really that put them in their place. Scotty. <laughs> Scotty. Scooter. <laughs> scooter. <laughs> a scooter, yeah, scooter. Yeah. Yeah, I got a contract from uh, Big Machine. What was it, like a week before that? Oh, man, that was hilarious, bro. I had Big Machine coming out to my house and stuff. I made them give me, they gave me free liquor. They gave me a free Flying V guitar. All for me to just say no, bro, but I did it on purpose. <laughs> Appreciate the guitar, Scott. But um, <laughs> I still got it. Um, But, yeah, now between Creekers and Holler Boys, Holler Boys is kind of like the we're, we're the rougher ones. It's out at the, the mud parks and shit. You know, the motherfuckers that... They see somebody pulled over on the side of the road with a flat tire. They'll pull over and be like, hey, you need some help. Or they're, they're just the, they're the helping blue-collar redneck group of people that are all over the world. And when I say all over the world, I really mean that. Like, we got stickers that people say HB uh, Ontario, HB Russia, HB uh, Africa, believe it or not. Uh, most every state in America. Like, it's not, it's not something that was planned. It's something that is a feeling from not only a country boy, but somebody's got a big-ass heart. 
but also got a big ass foot. You know, <laughs> yeah. that's a holler boy, baby. Hell yeah. Okay. That that narrows it down. See, I grew up on Possum Creek in a holler in Flatwoods, Tennessee. Nice. And currently live on Crooked Creek, so I feel like I'm kind of an honorary member of this whole creek. Are you like a creek or creek? He needs a HB <laughs> on the back of his truck glass. I gotta, I'll get one now. <laughs> yeah, all right. I'll get you one. Hell yeah. What do you think, Scott? I'm just absorbing all this. Um, bro, I will answer any question you got, bro. Yeah, bro. Oh, shit. So don't, Come on. Don't, don't, don't dig, think dig there's, Scott. Come on. Um, don't think there's don't, any questions that I won't answer because I will, bro. Don't oh, do that God. stock shit you've been doing now. I know. Well, uh, I guess to me, when I'm just sitting here listening to this conversation, I, I I feel like you have a lot of just passion. Yes, sir, I do. Deep, deep down. And I think that's what's resonating with the fans that you have. Get to the do point, you have a? <laughs> do you have a? Where is that coming from? Is that your upbringing? Or did somebody, you know, do you wrong or do you right? Or how? where is it that you get the, the, all that passion from? You may be real, bro. Yes. Yep. I have a song called Next to Red. And the reason I do what I do is because rednecks and people from the South have been getting shit on forever. And they finally got somebody that will talk shit to absolutely anybody and do it slicker for them so they don't have to do it. And that's why I am the way I am. And that's that's all there is to it. Awesome. People like me, bro, people like me that, you know, May have been in a little bit of trouble, but it's trying to do better. People, it's not trying to dwell on the past, but go forwards in the future, and you know, not not be no, not a hillbilly or a redneck or a country motherfucker. Be known as something that is goofy or something like that, because we're not. We're the ones that's gonna fucking shoot at people if they come over here and try to invade this country. We're the ones that's gonna teach you how to uh, get your own food. We're the ones gonna be making your clothes. We're the one that's gonna have the balls big enough to go dodge bullets for your ass. Absolutely. And that's what everybody needs to realize. I love Amen. that. Amen. Yeah. That's a great answer. So tell me about let's let's move. To, as we're getting ready to go out in March. I mean, we're right there. We're going into rehearsals real quick. We're getting ready to head back out too. Heck what's yeah. your stage show like? How many guys you carrying? I mean, what's what's your band situation like? Uh, let's see. So we just put together a new band. Uh, great, great, great people, and it's it's me, my three bandmates, uh, two sound guys. How many lighting guys? Two lighting guys and my boy B. And we do three different kinds of music. We start out with country. Uh, I think our set is how many songs? Uh, this 25 songs. About an hour and a half. Yes, sir. Uh, we do country first. Then we do rock rock and roll. And then we do rap. And then we do uh, encore. You mixing any cover things in from influences with your stuff? Uh, this year we are. This year we are. Uh, me and JJ are going to be singing. Uh, we're going to be singing Charlie Daniels as a cover. Uh, and then we're going to do. They're doing a medley of a bunch of different stuff from the '90s and 2000s cool. uh, and '80s mixed together. Uh, might sing some Fleetwood Mac. Never know. Like I like to, ABBA maybe. I like to tr- I like to change my uh, stuff up too, like right in the middle. So we might do, you know, thunder only headbones when it's raining, or we might do. Uh, I'm going through the big D and don't mean Dallas. Oh, you I can't, can't go wrong with some chestnut, man. No, man. Yeah, we might do some Tracy Lawrence, maybe if he left. Good man. Come on. Uh, we think maybe uh, we might be having uh, Clay Walker, Mike. Might come out for the Nashville show. We're not oh. sure yet. We gotta see how busy he is. What's the date on that first show? March 9th. March 9th. Clay Walker, bro. That dude, that dude's a real motherfucker too, bro. Yeah. Bro, me and him got drunk in the woods and drove my platinum through the woods and <laughs> fucked it up and had the time of our life, bro. <laughs> and hey, when the first time I ever met him, he like he was breaking a horse when I got to his house. I was like, shit, bro. And he was dressed up all nice like Elvis. I was like, damn, bro, he's doing both of those things. <laughs> damn. Who's, who's the craziest guy you met out on the road, man? Mm. Craziest guy I met out on the road. Artist-wise? It doesn't really matter. I mean, preferably artists some of that we'd know, but mm. I mean, I, I'm going to throw mine out there when you get done. I don't know. I really don't. I'll give you mine. You can think on it. Okay. And this guy's passed away, but he was he was just uh, he was a cool guy. You remember Rob Baronis? He was the kicker for the Tennessee Titans. Mm-hmm. 
and he got killed in a, in a, a solo vehicle crash several years ago. Oh, damn. Baronis used to get on the bus and come out with me, and I think we were with Blake Shelton up in Kentucky. And I, I don't remember. I think it was. It was somebody like that. And so Baronis, during my show, just came running out on the stage. I mean, we were packed. There's people all piled up in front of the stage. He just started crowd surfing off the front of the freaking stage. Mm. And I mean uh, – I think I think it was Blake got on the stage and the, my bus was pulled right up beside the stage and the blinds and everything were up. Verona started laying on a freaking air horn right in the middle of the freaking show. <laughs> he just didn't give a shit, man. I loved the guy. Absolutely yeah. loved him. I mean, he was one of those characters. Dude. That's cool. I think the craziest person I know is realistically. I just got to give you the real answer. My cousin Billy, bro. Tell me about my Billy. Cousin Billy. I got to know all bro. about Billy. Bro, he's six foot nine. Uh. And he's fucking crazy, bro. Like I, I've seen him, I've seen him fight like seven people at once. Holy crap! By himself, just fucking taking. He, he never starts shit though. He always just he'll finish it for other people or take up for people. But man, I've seen him take up for some people and do some crazy shit. <laughs> so my cousin Billy, shout out, Bo. Where Billy live? Billy lives. Uh, he lives in Cheatham too, Cheatham gotcha. County. If you guy, hey, if you're from the country, you gotta have a cousin named Billy, bro. <laughs> Man, I, I mean, I've enjoyed everything so much, man. It's been great getting to know you, man. I, I just, uh, what else? What else am I missing? Tell me all your social platforms. I'm sure everybody's going to be watching those how to find all your stuff. Shit. Uh, just at Up Church. Uh, at Up Church. At Up Church? Or at Up Church. Just type it. Google Up Church, bro. There you go. That's all you got to do. Yep. New tour starts on March the 9th. How many shows you got in the spring? I mean, uh, 52 And total right on now. the year right now? That's yes, good, sir. man. I'm ready to race hell and eat cornbread too, bro. I hell hope yeah, you do, my friend. I've enjoyed it so much. I've been looking forward to this so much, man. I've, I've, I've got, I got one for Come you. Come on, bring it, baby. I'm, I'm gonna retire this question after this one, but dude, I have to ask. This ask, dude. bro. All right, so I'm gonna give you my answer first, so you can kind of smell what I'm stepping in. Uh huh. So what's an, what's an insult you've received that you're the most proud of? So mine would be from our band leader. He says that I tune like old people fuck. Which <laughs> means slowly and with precision, I assume. But uh, you know, so so hmm. what, what's something like something like that for you? I can't lie, bro. I can't remember anybody ever like <laughs> insult me really. Um, fuck, probably being like he's on drugs just because I'm good at stuff. Uh, that's about it. That's the main one. He's on drugs. It's like, okay, well, if I'm on drugs, then a crackhead is doing better than you. So what does that mean? <laughs> if I'm a crackhead, then why am I doing better? I was like, like, boom. That's about it, though. Right on, <laughs> brother. I've enjoyed it. Hey, man, I've enjoyed it too. You leave anything on the table? Shit. I've enjoyed the conversation. It's been awesome. Bro, I've enjoyed it too. Shit, man. I've, I'm, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to have a interview with you that I can uh, look back on when I'm fucking old as shit and fucking can barely sing. Well, so hopefully after it. after you get done with your tour and uh, you get uh, the next project and everything moving forward, let's do this again. Bro, we have to, we have to catch up again. I have to make this shit, a bro, regular bro, reoccurrence. Let's get a boost, bro. Come on, man. It's all we, we can make some jams, bro. Trust me. I'm all about that. Ryan Up Church. Let's rock on out, baby. Come on.